Today on the show, I'm joined by Yaron Brook. Yaron comes onto the podcast to talk to us about the philosophy of objectivism, especially through the lens of a well-known writer called Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand has written many essays, philosophical essays, looking at objectivism, but she's most well known for four books, uh, We the Living, Anthem, The Fountainhead, and then finally her magnum opus, Atlas Shrugged. I really enjoyed Yaron coming on because he began to break down the difference for us, the listener, between faith versus reason. Faith being something we can't know and we hope to live and live into the world by and explores why faith isn't enough to make sense of and enjoy and fully live within life and why reason really is the crux and pinnacle of what we're trying to utilize to get to where we're going. There's this idea that reality is out there, it's here right now, we can touch it, it's tangible, we can engage with it, we can perform experiments on it, we can begin to get our hands into it. We engage with reality through reason and it has to be the individual who engages and uses their reason to interact with reality and there's a really interesting pattern going on here which Yaron explores with us on the show itself. Yaron mentions this term epistemology a couple of times in the show and just so you know epistemology is the theory of knowledge how we can have attain and utilize knowledge it's a fantastic conversation that we have with Yaron today I really valued his time and his thoughts as he explored Ayn Rand's life her works his own story and at the very end we have a fantastic few minutes where he talks about his views of faith and religion and why they are antithetical to objectivism, the philosophy that Ayn Rand represents. If you're new to When Belief Dies, I'd ask you to hit the subscribe button and then the notification bell. You'll be reminded then whenever we release a video. And if you wouldn't mind giving this video a thumbs up and then sharing it on social media with family members or friends, essentially that helps to boost our visibility. The thumbs up helps the algorithms, it helps others to find this conversation. Enough of that for now. I hope you enjoy this conversation on Ayn Rand and objectivism with Yaron Brook. Cheers. Hello and welcome to another episode of When Belief Dies. My name's Sam and today I'm joined by Yaron Brook. Yaron, it's great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me on, Sam. It's good to be here. So, Yaron, I've, I've been following you for quite a long time, uh, looking at your work and listening to a lot of your conversations. Um, I've found your thoughts and opinions around objectivism and Ayn Rand to be very stimulating and very challenging to me and my original beliefs, coming from a Christian background, now being more agnostic atheist. Um, they were very challenging, so I, I kind of want to dive into that, but I'm aware that a lot of my audience probably don't know who you are, so would you mind just giving us an overview about yourself and your work, if that's okay? Sure. Uh, so, um, I, uh, <laughs> where do I start? Um, I, for many years, was the uh, CEO of the Ayn Rand Institute from 2000 to 2017. I was the CEO of the Ayn Rand Institute. I am today the chairman of the board, and I'm sure we'll, we'll get into who Ayn Rand was and, and what are her ideas. Um, I first read Ayn Rand when I was 16, uh, in, uh, at the time I was living in Israel. And um, I, I was never religious, so that was never that was never an issue. But um, her philosophy blew my mind uh, when I was 16. It, it changed my perspective on a lot of different things in life, and has really shaped my life since then. Uh, and um, uh, I, I, I'm in a kind of what seems like a previous life. I was a civil engineer. I've got an MBA. I've got a PhD in finance. I was a finance professor. But what I spend my time doing today is really advocating for her ideas or applying her ideas. I have a, a YouTube channel. I'm on Twitter. I travel around the world uh, giving talks. I'll, I'll be in the, uh, in the UK in a couple of weeks uh, uh, to give a couple of talks. So uh, I'm, um, I'm all over the world speaking about really the application of Ayn Rand's ideas to everything, to your life as an individual to the uh, political world in which we live um, and, uh, and a kind of any, anything in between. 
It's amazing. And and what is it kind of, I guess, specifically that's kind of got you um, to be so enthused and so passionate about both objectivism and Ayn Rand? I'm aware we can dive into the terms and, and who she was shortly, but it'd just be good sure. to get that sort of spark from you. I'd say the, the, the number one thing that excited me about Ayn Rand was the idea that your life is, in a very deep, fundamental sense, yours. <laughs> It's, it's, it doesn't belong to the group. You don't owe it to the tribe. You're not a sacrificial animal to whoever decides that, that you should sacrifice for them. The needs of others are not a moral claim against you. The purpose of your life is your happiness and your success and, and your living the best life that you can live. And, and that was, for me... A real revolution. I, I grew up in Israel in the 60s and 70s, and and uh, it was a very collectivistic place. It was a it was a place in which you were part of this uh, nation, or even broader, you were part of this group called Jew, Jews, and you were expected to sacrifice your life for the greater good of the Jewish people, for the greater good of Israel. Uh, it, it was just it was just a question of you know, when the grenade was there so you could jump on it, that was, and that was the essence of virtue, was to sacrifice yourself. And, and Rand kind of asks this fundamental question. She asks, why? Uh, why should you sacrifice yourself? Why, why is other people's lives, uh, other people more important than you are? Why, uh, why are their lives uh, or their happiness or their success more important than your own? Uh, and that that was a real revolution for me that that shaped it. And then once you start taking your own life seriously, once you start focusing on your own happiness and your own success and your own flourishing as a human being, that's fun and that's exciting and that's uh, that's something to be passionate about. Be, and you, and you get the rewards from it, right? You, you, you and so. Uh, I'm excited and passionate primarily about the impact that Rand's ideas that objectivism has on the individual's life and that it gives him a kind of a moral sanction and a moral okay to pursue his own success and his own happiness. I was... Um a little bit of a tangent, but I think it's worth worth going down. I was talking to some yeah. friends recently. Um, they're both Polish and um, live over here in the UK now. Um, they're both in their 40s and lived for about good 10 years within socialism and then kind of got out of that system. Um, and I'd read uh, Mikhail Bukakov's um, The Master and Margarita, which is a very well-known Russian novel from the 1930s. Um, and I was kind of giving them my reflections on it. And what I, what kind of struck me quite quite fearfully is... I was very blind and am very blind to a lot of the uh, socialist, um, I guess, trends and elements or the collectivist trends and elements that Bulgakov was trying to get across because I've not been raised or brought up in that sort of environment. Um, I guess kind of, you know, this, this is probably diving quite deeply to start with, but it'd be really interesting to kind of hear from you having come from a bit more of a sort of collectivist um, mm -hmm. setting to a theoretically more individualist society like the US, but we can also get into whether that's true as well. Um, do you think it's possible for people who haven't been raised in that collectivist ideology to actually see the warning signs and the issues and the concerns? Um, or do you think it's something that actually we can begin to learn and teach ourselves through reading and conversations like this? So, yeah, I, I definitely think we can shape our own future. We can shape our own focus. And, and collectivism is learned and it can be unlearned individualism is in a sense chosen and learned and it can be unchosen and unlearned so i think people are much more flexible than than we often give them credit for um and and look there's the, the reality is that there's elements of individualism in israel israel could not be as successful as it is today without that there are strong elements of individualism in in israeli culture and in, in jewish culture more broadly and of course, there are strong collectivistic elements in the United States, and certainly in Europe. Uh, Europe is a very collectivistic place, not quite as collectivistic as I think Israel was in the 60s and 70s. And of course, Israel was also socialist back then, and that has changed. Uh, so Israel has moved systematically away from socialism since the early 1980s um, or the late 1970s. So. Uh, socialism and collectivism go hand in hand, but so does fascism and collectivism, and uh, uh, and so does. Much of the political systems that we have today go hand in hand with collectivism, just a milder form of collectivism, which allows some room for individualism. But what I learned from Ayn Rand and what gets me excited is not to settle for these mixtures. 
Individualism is good, in my view. Collectivism is evil. Why have a little bit of evil? Why, why, why do a little bit? So when I came to the United States, I was disappointed a little bit because, I, I mean, I knew somewhat what I was coming to, but I certainly wasn't disappointed in that it wasn't more individualistic. Um, and um, when I go now back to Israel, I see more individualism there than I did when I was uh, growing up there, but it, it could be a lot better. So my goal is, is, is to achieve the best possible, and the best possible is much better than anything exists today in the world in any country. Uh, but we have these mixtures. Um, some countries, I think the UK is, among European countries, is probably more individualistic and, and less collectivistic as compared to some other European countries. But it's none of them are good enough. Um, and, I, and I think people don't really realize how much they're missing out and uh, how much poorer they are, not just poorer materially, but poorer spiritually, poorer in lack of happiness, poorer in lack of opportunities to grow and to flourish as human beings because they don't take their lives seriously and because they're not focused on pursuing their own happiness and pursuing their own lives because they bought into a, a morality of collectivism in one way or another to some degree or another. Beautifully said. Yeah, yeah. There are a few more questions down that vein which we can get to in due course. But um, before we do, it, it, it's a very big question, a very big ask, um, Yaron. But would you mind giving us an overview of um, Ayn Rand and her work? Yeah, so I'll give you a bit of a biography because I think it's kind of it's interesting. Her life was interesting, and, and and we'll talk about her work as well. I mean, uh, Rand was born in 1905 in uh, St. Petersburg, Russia. She was born to a, a, a middle class Jewish family. Alicia Rosenblum was was Rosenblum was her original name. Uh, fa her father owned a pharmacy, um, and uh, in 1917, uh, when she was 12, she witnessed the Russian Revolution and and witnessed the the communist takeover of uh, of Russia and everything that that. Uh, was involved in that. I meant uh, no more ph pharmacy for her father. No more living in a in an apartment by themselves. Now sharing an apartment, and 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 no more freedom of speech, uh, and and uh, and the, the whole environment and uh, oppression that communism involved. Uh, she went to university in what what was uh, communist Russia, and and quickly realized that. She wouldn't survive if she stayed there. I mean, uh, uh, she would be killed. She she was too much of an individualist. She was too much, uh, had her own views, her own opinions. She didn't conform. Uh, she was this uh, uh, individualistic uh, rebel within this uh, world of conformity that was uh, communism. Uh, there was a small window of opportunity in the uh, 1920s where uh, Stalin, uh, not Stalin, it was Lenin still, uh, I guess, let, uh, allowed some people out uh, uh, on, on different visas or different, uh, and she, she got out um, to do research uh, related to something she was working on at the university uh, in the United States. And she managed to get out, and she managed to get to the United States, where she had relatives in Chicago. Um, she spent a little time in Chicago, but then she headed to Hollywood. She wanted to be a writer. From age seven, she had decided she wanted to be a writer, and she loved American movies. She had seen silent movies in in, um, in uh, Russia, and she had fallen in love with cinema, and she wanted to be in the movie business. She wanted to write for the movies. So she here's this little Russian girl. I think she was 22 years old. She arrives in Hollywood with nothing. I mean, literally nothing. And she shows up at the studios of the Cesar B. DeMille um, uh, company and of course, uh, I mean, most of your listeners probably don't know, know who Cecil B. DeMille was, but he was a Steven Spielberg of his day. I mean, he was the director of his day. And uh, you know, they said, you know, don't call us, we'll call you, but we, we don't really have anything. And but she walks out, and there's Steven, there is uh, Cecil B. DeMille sitting in his big convertible out, outside, and and he, he, she stares at him, and he 
asks her why she's staring, and she tells him his story, the story about being here from Russia, and she wants to be in the film industry, and she wants to be a writer, and and uh, he's, he says, "Get in, I'll 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 show you how movies are made," <laughs> and he takes her to. Uh, the back lot of the studio where they're filming The King of Kings, the story of Jesus Christ of all movies. And he gives her a pass and he and, uh, says, you, why don't you spend a week watching how movies are made? And, and uh, she lands up becoming an extra on the movie set. She meets her future husband on the movie set. Uh, and she lands up finding odds and ends jobs, not as a writer, obviously. She's still young and she's still... English is a, very much a second language at this point. And, but she starts spending her time writing and studying and f figuring out English. And, and she lands up writing a play that is actually performed in L.A. and actually makes it to Broadway and is performed in New York. She lands up writing a book called We the Living, which is a, a story of a young woman in the, in Russia and caught into communism. So it's the most autobiographical of all her books, even though it's not autobiographical. Very powerful story about real life, what life is like in the communism. Um, and uh, that is not hugely successful, but it's it gets out there. Uh, and and she slowly advances also in Hollywood, and she she ultimately will become a script writer and she does write some scripts for movies and she, she edits some scripts and she helps them choose scripts for movies. But then in, um, in uh, 1945, she has a book called um, The Fountainhead, which, which uh, she has written. And, oh, uh, before that, she publishes a small book called The Anthem and actually it gets published in the UK before it gets published in the US. And, and there's good... Uh, you know, it, it's a dystopian mo novel that um, it, it, it's likely that before 1984 is written, um, uh, Anthem was published, and, and there's some. You can see some cross influences uh, across these different, uh, uh, you know, dystopian novels. Anyway, she writes *The Fountainhead*. Twelve publishers reject it. Finally, a publisher accepts it and publishes it, but it's not that confident that it'll sell. So they only like print 2,000 copies. But word of mouth has, has this huge impact. It sells very quickly. Um, it then they go into another printing and another printing and another printing, and it, it becomes a bestseller, New York Times bestselling uh, novel. It gets quite uh, very positive reviews. It, it, it's, uh, and to this day, it, it sells you know, over 100,000 copies. It's translated to pretty much every language in the world. I think there are only two major languages in which Ayn Rand's uh, works have not been published, and that is Arabic and Farsi. I, I think every other la every other major language in the world, uh, her work is, is translated. Um, so she does very well from the Fountainhead. She returns to Los Angeles. Uh, she, she, she works in Hollywood. She does some scripts. Uh, in the meantime, she's, she writes a book called uh, Atlas Shrugged, uh, which lands up being her uh, her last novel, and Atlas Shrugged. Um, it, by this point, publishers compete to publish it. Uh, when it's published, it's an instant bestseller, and again, it sells hundreds of thousands of copies to this day in all kinds of languages. Um, in writing Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged, Ayn Rand always had one goal for her writing. She wanted to project what she calls the ideal man, and. So she did a lot of research about what is an ideal man? What does the culture think an ideal man? What does philosophers think an ideal man? What can I learn from them? And, and she's very disappointed in what she sees. There's very little consideration, and when there is a, a talk about the ideal man, it's not her ideal man. To her, Jesus is not an ideal man. Uh, the Nietzschean Superman is not an ideal man. And, and most philosophers just don't project the kind of what she sees as the human potential. So she lands up having to come up with her own philosophy and discover her own philosophy and figure out her philosophy as she's writing these novels. And the novels are very philosophical. Uh, and there is a projection of what she believes is an ideal man and an ideal woman and, and, and ultimately what an ideal society should look like. Um, and, uh, but that is all. So the philosophy serves her literature. Uh, she's writing. She's thinking about philosophy in order to write the novels, but once the novels are published, she then turns to writing that philosophy. 
So she spends, uh, Atlas Shrugged is published in 1957, and she spends the next, uh, the, the rest of her life, she died in 1982, she spends the rest of her life really writing philosophy and applying philosophy to current events and, uh, and, and kind of teaching her philosophy to, pu to, to students, to philosophers, um, and, and creating objectivism, which is the name she gave to her philosophy, and, and kind of a movement around uh, objectivism. So, uh, so she wrote books, uh, books of essays. Uh, uh, there's a, a book on her epistemology called The Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology. There's a book on her ethics called The Virtue of Selfishness, a book on her politics called uh, Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal, and, and a, a, a series of other books, Philosophy Who Needs It, with e philosophical essays uh, applying the philosophy to issues of the day and to issues of, of human life. And, and maybe I should say something about the philosophy. So what is the philosophy? So this is kind of on one foot. Obviously, it's philosophy, so whole books uh, can be said. But, but in, in a very short um, reality is what it is. This is her metaphysics. Reality is what it is. Your wishes don't change reality. Your wishes don't make reality. You don't create reality. And there is no other consciousness out there that creates reality. Reality just is. It always has been. And it is. It, 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 and it functions by the laws of, of, of nature, of, of, of reality. We as, as human beings... Um, have the capacity to, to know reality, to, to discover reality and understand reality, that, and that is reason. That is human reason, our ability to, uh, to identify and integrate the material provided to us by our senses, and our senses are indeed connected to reality. They, they give us information about reality. Um, so, uh, you know, reason is our means of knowledge, not our emotions. Our emotions are important. Emotions are wonderful. You experience life through your emotions. They're not tools of cognition. They don't tell you uh, the truth about the world out there. They might tell you something about you, but not about the world out there. For that, you need reason. Um, and, uh, and, and, and the world is knowable. That is, uh, she rejects skepticism and, uh, completely, this idea that we can't know reality, that we don't know reality. Uh, so uh, we can know reality, and the tool for knowing it is reason. And, and uh, the alternative, of course, is emotion. The other alternative is revelation. There is no such thing as revelation, not the platonic kind of Plato with the world of forms and somehow the philosopher communicates with it, nor of religion where God kind of tells you what the truth is. Uh, you know, truth is not... Truth, it needs to be discovered. It needs to be discovered by you, and it needs to be discovered by the use of your reason. Um, so she rejects, uh, she rejects kind of uh, all forms of superstition and all forms of mysticism. Um, only the individual can reason. Uh, the reality is that you can't eat for me. You can't think for me. Um, and indeed, thinking is, uh, is what makes us human, and thinking is what makes it possible for us to survive as human beings. And, and the unit, the unit of, of, of value here, the unit that thinks, the unit that survives, is the individual human being. And therefore, in morality, her view is that what matters is the individual and his life, and what matters is his ability to survive, thrive, and ultimately flourish. And to do that, he must apply his reason to the question of how to live. And therefore, she derives a morality from the facts of human existence and the facts of human uh, nature and, and human need to survive and uh, of his need to use reason in order to survive. So her morality is reason-based uh, and is focused on the individual's own happiness and own success and own flourishing. Uh, as, she, as she would say, no, not sacrificing himself to others but also not asking others to sacrifice to him. This is a, a this is a morality of individualism, where you don't uh, you, you don't again live for other people, but you don't expect other people to live for you either. Uh, you live for yourself and interact with other people uh, by means of trade, either spiritual trade or or, or, or material trade, but. Uh, 
win-win relationships where you benefit from them and they benefit from you. Uh, and that is the nature, the nature of a healthy human relationship is through this relationship of win-win uh, relationship of trade. And in, in order to achieve all this, you need to be free. You need to be free to think, to use your mind, to use your reason. And therefore, you need to be able to act on your thoughts. You, you might be right, you might be wrong, you might make mistakes, but you need to be able to be, to, to, to be free to test, to check these things out. And as long as you're not hurting other people, as long as you're not violating the rights of other people, you should be left free to uh, use your rational judgment in pursuit of your rational values, free of coercion, free of force. And the only political system uh, that allows for that is capitalism. Capitalism is that political system that leaves individuals free to pursue their own values using their own judgment, free of coercion, free of force, free of control uh, by the government. So she rejects socialism, she rejects fascism, she rejects all forms of statism. Uh, she is for individual liberty, individual freedom. So that's, that, that is the, the, the basic arc of her philosophy. I mean, we could get into the aesthetics if you want, but um, that's a whole other, whole other issue. Yeah, no, that was that was really well said. I think one of the questions I can imagine someone in the audience asking is, um, why is her philosophy not known as individualism? Then why is it known as objectivism? Is there a is there a reason why it became known to be that instead of individualism? Yes, because I think at the heart of her uh, philosophy is this conception of reason. Hmm. Um, so you, you know, it, it should have been called reasonism, but that sounds weird. <laughs> And so you could have called it rationalism, but rationalism was already taken, uh, the rationalist philosophies, and, and the rationalists are very different than Ayn Rand's philosophy, so she didn't want to be associated with Descartes and, and, and philosophers of that nature. Um, so she was looking for something um, epistemological, something that, that was like reason, that, that related to, to, to what man does in order to achieve his individualism, in order to achieve his success. Um, and and uh, object, objectivism, objectivity uh, is at the heart of that. What is objectivity? Objectivity is identifying reality, identifying the facts. It, it's a mistake to think of objectivity as uh, 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 presenting both sides of an argument. I mean, how many sides are there? There could be 55 sides of an argument. So objectivity is not about presenting lots of positions. It's about considering and then discovering the truth, discovering what's real, discovering what, what is actually in reality, what is, what is real in reality, i.e. what is true. So, um, so, the, so uh, objectivity is the means by which we, we attain knowledge. It's the means by which reason functions and therefore it's the closest to reason that she could come up with uh, as as a name for the philosophy. She she wanted a she wanted to ground it in epistemology. She didn't want it to be too political. Individualism is is somewhat of a political you know because the contrast with collectivism, which is a political ideology. She didn't view her philosophy as primarily political. She viewed her philosophy as primarily epistemological and and uh, ethical and moral. I really like that. And and the fact that we're saying reality is a fundamental fact, we use reason to interpret that and the individual has to have that um, onus on themselves to go and use reason to understand and interact with reality. Yeah, to understand reality and to, and to, to figure it out, to, to figure out what's true and what's not, what's right and what's, uh, what's not. So, uh, and, and that is what reason is for. It's, you know, and, and, and one of the, you know, the, the, the important moral point is, and it's a moral epistemological point, is every other animal out there uh, basically is born with the uh, recipe for survival coded into their DNA. They know exactly what to do. They, 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 there's no choices available to them. It's, it's as close as we have to AI, right? They, they, they get the inputs and the output is determined by the algorithm inside the, the genetic code. Human beings are not like that. We're an evolutionary leap in this sense. We don't have the software coded in. We have the hardware, we have, we have a, a, a brain and a mind and we have the capacity to engage and to write the software. We have the capacity uh, you know, to, to, we have to figure out how to survive. We don't know how to survive. 
You know, a, 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 a bird has how to fly coded into it. Um, a human being does not, agriculture is not coded into anybody. Hunting even is not coded in. So uh, people had to discover when they went to hunt, they had to figure stuff out. Figure stuff out. Use reason. They had to build tools. They had to build weapons. They had to um, communicate in order to maybe uh, uh, hunt together. They had, to, they had to build traps. They literally had to do things that required cognition. And, and you know, I often ask audiences, how many of you have the gene for hunting? And there might be a few guys in the audience who think they do, but they don't. You, everything that human beings create, literally everything, requires thinking, requires thought. And thinking is not automatic. It doesn't just turn on. Indeed, there are a lot of people out there, unfortunately, who never think or don't think. They mimic, they copy, they follow, but they don't think. And thinking requires effort. And the particular effort that thinking requires is focus. It requires, you know, it requires somebody to engage in free will. And I know free will is a controversial issue among many people, but it shouldn't be. It's, it's, it's the basic thing that human beings do uh, it, it, because uh, we have to engage with our reason. It doesn't turn on automatically. And some people choose not to turn it on and, and, and that's, that's, uh, that's the sad state of, of, of many people in humanity. But to the extent that you turn it on and you engage and you focus and you look and you, and you observe reality and you understand it and you integrate and you exert the effort to understand and to learn and to grow, that's the extent to which you will be successful as a human being. And to the extent that you don't, you just drift. That's the extent to which you will fail as a human being. I had a, um, a question which I was going to save to the end, which was from a patron, which I'll read, but then I want to kind of frame it as well within this in this context so um they're kind of saying um you know uh iron rand is all about selfishness and they say then that it's often claimed uh by people that when they engage with iron rand uh, the idea that the self being at one center can't lead to fulfillment um i'd be interested to kind of get your take on that but also kind of just reflecting before you do jump into kind of pushing back on this idea of um, it's just selfishness and you can't be fulfilled if you're at the center of everything um it kind of sounds like what you're saying is that as you use reason you begin to use also cooperation with those around you that you have that win-win relationship and actually it sounds like although the self is at the center it's still in a holistic way you're still deriving value and freedoms and life i i guess through those interpersonal connections and those relationships but yeah I'd, I'd love to get your take on that yeah so first I, I don't want to run away from the term selfish right what does selfish mean it, it it's it's contrasted with selfless selfless means uh, not taking responsibility for self not taking care of self not focusing on self and and yeah selfish is the right term in the sense that uh Ayn Rand's morality is about focusing on making your life the best life that it can be. The most flourishing, most successful. Does that involve other people? Well, of course it does. <laughs> I mean, it would be bizarre if it didn't. Uh, living on a desert island is no fun, and it's not the best life that you can live. There's no way it's the best life that you can live. I depend on gazillions of people to, I don't know, produce the iPhone so that I can enjoy or, or or, or build internet platforms so we can do this in, in this interview. And see, I have this unbelievable appreciation for all those people and an unbelievable appreciation of business generally and unbelievable appreciation for inventors and scientists because I'm selfish, because all of the stuff that they have discovered and they do and they produce, I benefit from. And isn't that so cool? So thank you to all the producers out there and all the innovators and all. See... And that, it gives you a completely different perspective on, on life and on the world. You, you become much more uh, appreciative of the efforts of other people and much more thankful for other people. And, and uh, you know, so, so I love trading with people. I love 
uh, buying stuff, selling stuff, um, and uh, and uh, so I. I want other people, you know, I, I don't want to get money for nothing. I want to be able to provide a service and I, I, I'm, I'm happy to trade because I, I you know, if, if, uh, if somebody is going to, I want some, if I'm going to get something for somebody, I want it to be because of something that is worthwhile. Um, that's part of me being proud of the work that I do. I don't want, I don't want a free lunch. I don't want somebody just to give me stuff, right? That, that would diminish me. Um, so selfishness really means this idea of viewing everything out there from the perspective of how does it contribute to my life and it turns out wow gazillions of people do and and amazing stuff is happening out there and it's like i'm incredibly benevolent to other people because other people contribute so much to my life and then that's kind of at a at a, at a, at a, a, a social level but then uh, what about i mean think about the value you get from friendship and the immense visibility and the immense emotional satisfaction and, and spiritual satisfaction you get in friendship. And friendship is not about sacrifice. Friendship is, again, it's about the spiritual trade. This is about giving and getting. And, and if you don't think it's trade, try doing friendship just one-sided and see how long that lasts. Um, and, and, of course, take it one level further. What about love? I mean, whoa, is there, are there many more important things than love in a human being's life in terms of, I mean, love is the most selfish emotion you can have. It's what this woman makes me feel. It's what this woman, you know, it makes my life better, my life better. <laughs> I'm not sacrificing for her. I'm, I, I love her because it makes me a better human being, because it makes me feel better about myself and about life and about the world. So, uh, love is incredibly selfish, friendship is incredibly selfish, and it's not about being the center of the universe. I, I, I don't think selfishness is about being egocentric. I'm not the center of the universe. I mean, being the center of the universe is more um, narcissistic. I, I don't think everybody should view me as the center of the universe. For them, their life is the center. So I'm the center for me, but for them, they're the center, and therefore, the only way I, I can deal with them is is through trade and through friendship and through love and through whatever appropriate relationship uh, there is. But I, I find that people who take this attitude, take Ayn Rand's philosophy seriously and, and have this profound respect for their own life and the importance of their own life and, and want to make their life the best life that it can be, actually have a very, very benevolent view of other people, treat them really, really well because they realize how much value they can get in return. Now. Saying all that, some people are really, really bad. Some people do you harm. And one thing objectivism teaches you is stay away from those people. Don't feel a duty to interact with people who are harmful to you. Don't feel a duty to write a check to that sibling of yours who's a complete loser, who will never make anything of their life and is leeching off of you. You don't owe them anything. You, you know, and in that sense, it could even be your parents. You, you, in a sense, don't owe your parents anything beyond what, you know, what they gave you. If they gave you love and they gave you a, a, a nice uh, upbringing and a nice, then, yeah, I mean, you, you, hopefully you love them and you, you, you can repay them in a sense. But if your parents were lousy parents, you don't owe them because of blood or because of genes. So it, 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 objectivism and, and this whole approach of being self-interested it's all about judging people out there and evaluating them. Are they good for me? Are they bad for me? Stay away from people who are bad for you and embrace people who are good for you. Now, it turns out that at least at a superficial level, almost over, most people are good for you. And uh, then there are a few people who are really good for you and you want to be friends. And then there's one or two people that you're really going to love and, and they're special. And, you know, at the peak of that is romantic love. So... You know, judging people is important and, and having a hierarchy of, of relationships is important. You don't treat everybody the same. Ayn Rand rejects egalitarianism and she rejects sacrifice or self-sacrifice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything you're saying, um, I mean, it's just, it's, it's making me think of, um, Howard Rourke, right? It's, it, it yep. really is. And so one of my, um, one of my questions is around kind of, um, trying to help us understand objectivism through Ayn Rand's works like how does she go about um relaying and portraying the, the very things you're saying within her four novels and her essays the four novels are probably known the most but yeah I'd, I'd love to get your take on how she actually pushes that 
vein of thought out through her pages? Well, I mean, it's very clear in in her novels. These ideas are very clear in her novels. Howard Rourke uh, is the is the hero of the Fountainhead. He is an architect, and from the beginning, from the first line, where Howard Rourke, which is Howard Rourke laughs, it is clear that he is a man who is com- who is completely in control of his life, who and knows what his values are. He's trying to understand the world. He doesn't quite understand the world. He does by the end of the novel, but he's struggling to understand other people. But in terms of himself and what he wants and what his values are, he is focused on that. He understands it, and and he pursues those values ruthlessly without compromise. He never uses people. He never never allows himself to be used by other people. He has uh, complete integrity. And it's integrity in ways that people are often surprised when it comes to Ayn Rand, because people associate, and this is part of part of the real, um, I think, evil in the culture that we live in. People associate self-interest and selfishness with money. If I say I'm self-interested, oh, you're just greedy, you just want lots of money. Now, maybe I do want a lot of money, but that isn't my defining characteristic. That isn't what being self-interested mean being self-interested mean i want to live the best life that i can live money might be a part of that it, it has to be a part of that no matter what because you have to survive money is essential for survival but is that the only thing that's important for somebody who is self-interested of course not that would be ridiculous money is just a means it's a tool uh, so for for how to work what's really important to him is his integrity his artistic aesthetic integrity he wants to build buildings He's an architect the way he uh, believes they should be built, that they, are consistent uh, with his vision of architecture. And there's a scene in the novel where he is offered, he, he's struggling, he, he has no clients, he's making no money, he, he, he has nothing. And he's offered this unbelievably lucrative job. He's going to build this a skyscraper for a bank and he's, he's going to get rich. And all they want is for him to compromise on some elements in his design. Just put in some Greek columns where he doesn't believe they should be Greek columns. And he says no. And people go, and and Ayn Rand's point is, that's what selfishness means. Selfishness means sticking to your principles. Selfishness means pursuing your values. Money? Money is a... A, 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 a means for facilitating this trade. But if what I'm getting in return it, it undermines my moral principles, my aesthetic principles, it undermines who I am as a human being, there's no price for that. You give me a gazillion dollars, I'm not giving you that. So no matter how much they offer him, how it works not building a building he doesn't believe in. And he'd rather, it turns out, work in a quarry in manual labor than design buildings he doesn't believe in. And that is, that's, if people just got this one thing out of the fountainhead, right? That's what selfishness really means. It means really understanding what your principles are, really understanding what your life requires and what your happiness requires, and living by that. It's not about, I don't know, just just uh, money grubbing, which is kind of the, the attitude people assume selfishness is. So, so that's in, in, in the Fountainheads. The Fountainheads very much focused on uh, an, it, it, the presentation of individual morality and, and how it plays out in a man's life and, and what, what success looks like when you pursue kind of this morality. And, you know, I don't want to give the novel away, but so I encourage people to read it. Atlas Shrugged then is a is a, a bigger book in a sense it, it deals more with not just the individual also the individual and there are striking examples of individuals there that that face very similar kind of alternatives as work does and 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 i think choose properly and some who don't and suffer the consequences uh, but here it's a it's kind of a society-wide lesson it's uh it's more um, uh, the theme is, is, is broader and deeper than, than uh, individual morality. Uh, it, it really, when Ayn Rand was asked what the theme of Atlas Shrugged was, she said it was the role of reason in man's life, the role of the mind in man's life. Uh, and, and you can see what happens when somebody is committed to reason and when somebody abandons reason. And, and when society 
it respects reason when society abandons reason. And, and it's all geared to that. And people usually think of Atlas Shrugged as a political book, but it's not. It's about epistemology. And, and that's, that's crazy, and, and, but that's, that's how Ayn Rand thought. And it's an exciting book. It's, a, it's, it's an exciting book uh, that is so relevant to life in the world today. And, and what you see there is A, reason versus unreason, uh, living your life for yourself versus not. There's a great character in Atlas Shrugged, uh, Reardon, who, who, in, who uh, um, is struggling. He, he, is, he lives uh, uh, kind of his family life. He lives on the morality of altruism and the morality of sacrifice and the morality of his family owns him in a sense. He, he, he's gui he feels guilty uh, for not giving them enough, but he doesn't really want to give them that much, and he feels guilty for not spending enough time with his wife, but he doesn't really want to spend that much time with her. Uh, what he really wants to do is, is work, and he loves his work, he's passionate about his work, he's completely self-interested when it comes to his work, but he, but he, he, he thinks that's, that's material and low. Uh, he thinks sex is material and low at the beginning of the novel, and he has to learn. He has to learn that, no, this is the best in him. And if he needs to apply this, the principle that he applies at his work, to sex, to his relationship with his family, to every aspect of his life, and that, that the way he changes throughout the novel is, is one of the most interesting features of the novel. But again, it illustrates every aspect of her philosophy. Facts, reason, individualism, a, a morality of self-interest. So... Uh, she does that throughout the novel, through all her characters and through the plot. And then, of course, in her nonfiction, you know, she's got an essay, uh, the, the Objectivist Ethics, where she talks about selfishness. She even talks about why she calls it selfishness. And, and, um, and she, she, so she's, uh, these are more philosophical essays. Now, granted, they're philosophical, but they're not written for philosophers. They're written for the layman. And, and I think a lot of academic philosophy's rejection of her has to do with the fact that she didn't write their language, right? You pick up a philosophy book, it's hard to understand. Ayn Rand is easy to understand and because she's writing in your language. It, it, she's not easy to fully grasp. A lot of her stuff you have to read more than once, but the language is the language that every... And the, and the, and the chain of logic is, is understandable, and it's in English. It's not in philosophies. Will you support when belief dies? Your support enables us to keep having these conversations and improving everything that we do. There are three ways to support when belief dies. Firstly, would you rate when belief dies in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Audible? Rating us in these spaces boosts our visibility. Secondly, would you share this episode with your family, friends, and followers? We grow mainly through word of mouth, so please consider who might find this a helpful conversation and share it with them. Lastly, would you consider supporting the show financially? You can support the show on Patreon with a monthly gift or a one-off donation via PayPal or Bitcoin. Everything you give goes directly towards the running and improving of the podcast and YouTube channel. All links are in the description and thank you for supporting the show. Right. Let's get back to this week's conversation. Yeah, it's I I really really appreciate her style. Um, yeah, I I I also interestingly read the books in probably the reverse order, and that they were published. No, it was the reverse order. So I read Atlas Shrugged, then The Fountainhead, uh, then Anthem, then We the Living. I'm actually halfway through We the Living at the moment. Um, finding it devastating actually uh, it's it's such a it, so I've, I've i've read things like the gulag archipelago um yep. by uh, alexander stolchenitskin and that's all about kind of what life was like in these concentration camps essentially within soviet russia at the time and I, i've actually found that we the living seems to be providing me more of a down on the ground what communism looked like and and how things yeah. were stripped away from people and the fact that they're they're eating food and trying to get food and having to go hungry and then trying to and 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 again it's you know uh, Kira, I believe her name is the sort of main character uh, within this novel, at least currently, um, is trying to live her life in this very kind of self, I want to go in this direction and I want to build bridges. Um, that's what she's trying to do. And she's having to do that and also live within this sort of regime, which is completely counter to who she is as a person. How how would you encourage people, um, Yaron, to, to, to 
engage with her books? Would you say to kind of start at the beginning and work to the end, or would you encourage them to start with something like The Fountainhead first, maybe? No, I would encourage them to start with The Fountainhead. I, I, I read Atlas Shrug first, and then The Fountainhead, and then Anthem and We the Living, so like you. Uh, but I, I would encourage them to start with uh, The Fountainhead. If they really, really, really don't like fiction for some reason, which I don't understand, but if they don't, um, then they can start with uh, Virtue of Selfishness or Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal. And I agree with you. I also read Solzhenitsyn, and I find, I find We the Living in some ways much more powerful because it sets up this amazing young woman who, who just wants to live her life, but she's very rational and very thoughtful about it. And the obstacles she runs across and then uh, the, the, the men that she falls in love with and the conflicts that that creates and all she's trying to do is, is, is live her life and she can't. And, and then how the system affects different people, like she won't give up, but how does it affect the other people and how does it destroy, not just destroy them, materially but how does it destroy them spiritually how does it destroy their capacity to live and to enjoy life and i think she does a, a magnificent job at that but i would definitely start with the fountainhead i think it gives it's it's the most personal novel uh for the reader i think and it's the most engaging and then uh you know if you're really into politics let's say uh or in uh, politics and philosophy then you could start with the, with atlas shrugged and then read the fountainhead but i think for most people i would say Start with the fountainhead, and then and then go to Atlas Shrugged. And and in in all four of these books, um, when a character, um, whether they be living through a sort of objectivist lens themselves or not, when they see somebody who's who is living with self at the center, um, they they're often describing how they appear to them. And 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 Ayn Rand uses very almost mathematical or maybe. Um, geometrical or, or masculine in a sort of way language to define she talks about the lines of their face and how their head was upright and how their back was straight um she talks about the figures of, of the of, of the ladies and sort of how their legs were positioned and things it's very it's such interesting language i've not sort of seen that anywhere else but um she seems to almost be um imbuing these characters with definitive um complete imagery whereas other characters she'll maybe mention the sort of shoes they were wearing or the the scuffs on their jacket whereas these characters are full people in a sort of way and I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit for us yeah I mean I think I think she's an artist and, and she's trying to through the way she's describing these people and, and the way they they stand and the way they walk and the way they carry themselves to tell you something about their character uh, she can't she can't invest in every one of the characters the full time to teach you or to tell you about them she can only do that to a few characters who are the heroes of the story but she wants you to get a sense of the character. And we all know that often we get uh, strong first and, and often correct lasting impressions just by looking at somebody, how they dress or how they carry themselves or how they walk. Uh, you know, I, I do think love at first sight exists because we can connect in, in some way very quickly and, and very directly with those kind of things. Uh, in other people, so she's she is um, activating that. So she's trying to activate your, uh, you know, maybe a certain perception of what masculinity is, and a certain perception of what femininity is, and also a certain percentage perception of what a horrible pe person would look like, or what they would do, and 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 how they would be maybe bent over, and maybe the particularly, you know, ugly. She's not saying. Everybody who's ugly is a bad person, but she's using it as an artistic mechanism to activate a certain emotion, a certain context for the reader, um, and, and, and she wants to present her heroes heroically. Uh, it's art. It's in art, you know, is, I think she agreed with, with um, Aristotle, art should present a reality as it should and could be, right? But should and could. So she's trying to present people as, as, as um, the heroes as, as heroic and therefore having a, the stature of, of heroes. And she had a very definitive view of what she thought masculinity and femininity were uh, as an artist uh, and, and, and how to convey that. And of course, as an artist, you have to have some insight into human psychology to, 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 be, able to, to be able to really project your characters effectively. And we've kind of talked about the sort of vision of of the perfect man and, and her sort of research around what that looked like. You mentioned 
obviously Nietzsche, um, the idea of kind of Superman or um, kind of yeah, kind of beyond good and evil, almost the, the sort of power, uh, the power to will. Um, so I, I think it'd be interesting just to kind of talk a, a little bit about Iron Man then around the sort of um, uh, the, the idea of masculinity and the perfect man and how she does portray that because there does seem to be the, man isn't always used necessarily in a sort of um, humanity everybody but sometimes it really is kind of actually a, a male figure that she's kind of writing about here and and for some people that can be a bit of a turn off but i think it'd be good just to address it to kind of help people understand what they should expect sure so first uh, she does use in her writing she does use man to represent humanity this was not different than pretty much everybody else <laughs> at the time this is pretty standard english um at the time, uh, you know, the, the, it's only in modern times that we do he, she, and all this uh, stuff in order to cover everybody. Um, but she does have, she does believe men and women are different, and, and uh, that they have certain psychological differences, and, and that they have, um, you know, certain differences in how they're oriented. Um, and, and you could agree and disagree with that, but, but she definitely has a particular view of that. And, and for her... And, and look, just to put this in perspective, um, the hero of Atlas Shrugged, I mean, the one, the, the hero of Atlas Shrugged in the sense that the one written most about in the book is a woman, uh, Dagny Taggart, who runs a railroad. Now, this is 1957. Ayn Rand has shattered any glass ceiling that might have existed. She places a woman as clearly the most competent person on planet Earth to run the most important railroad on planet Earth. And she does it efficiently, efficaciously. She's a negotiator. She's tough. She's amazing. Dagny is just amazing as a business person. And, and, but she's a woman. <laughs> and for Rand, there's something different between a, 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 a woman who's a business person and a man who's a business person in terms of their personal life, in terms of their psychological life, in terms of she's feminine and she exudes femininity when she's at a party, when she's in a social environment, when she's having sex. Um, and, and, and men, while they might not be as competent as her in business, in a different setting, they exude masculinity. So for her, saying somebody's, something's feminine or something's masculine is not a judgment. <laughs> it, 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 it's a positive. It's a positive for it, to, to be masculine. It's a positive to be feminine. Both are, both are positives. Um, so there's nothing inferior about being a, a woman. Uh, but she does have this view that men, that masculinity is an orientation towards uh, reality, towards conquering nature. It's, it's towards discovery out there. And that femininity as, as, a, as, a, as a psychological characteristic is oriented towards a man towards um, a, 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 a finding a hero uh, and, and, and admiring a hero. So there is that psychological orientation that she identifies with masculinity and femininity. Again, you can agree with that or not. I think, still think you'll love the heroes. And particularly when you realize that in spite of Dagny's orientation towards looking for a hero, a man who is a hero to love, she's also a heroine. Uh, she's a superhero, really, and, and she's the most competent railroad executive in the world. So, um, so I, I, I think people love the characters uh, in, in these novels and love this representation. It's very unmodern. It's very non-modern uh, in, in a sense of that modernity is so much about the no differences between men and women. No, there are differences, and we should celebrate them. Yeah, I, I, t I totally agree. I think they're fantastic, the, the novels and, and that and, and that mantra. Um, so I've got three more, four more questions. Um, the sort of next one is around, I guess, kind of um, Ayn Rand, end of life. Um, it's it's often viewed that, uh, I don't know if this is true or not, that, that um, when somebody's living out this sort of um, objectivist 
mindset that as they get towards the end of their life, because they're no longer to necessarily do everything that they want to be able to do, uh, that sort of happiness begins to subside because maybe they've not built the family around they wanted or they've not built the support networks, etc., etc., because they've been go, go, go. Um, and I thought it'd be interesting, you know, to kind of get your take on that, that towards the end of Iron Man's life, she was maybe kind of sad or disappointed that it hadn't been everything that she thought it could be. I don't know whether that's true, but I think it'd be helpful to kind of view objectivism through that sort of final day stage where people do get to the end and kind of begin to reflect back as well. So I don't think that was true of Ayn Rand. I, I think she might have been saddened by the fact that the world did not live up to her expectations. That is, that the world was not as good as she thought it could be and that it had not responded to her quite as positively as she had hoped they would. Um, in spite of being bestsellers, in spite of all her success, and monetary success and esteem, I mean, she, she was on TV, she was in the White House, she was, I mean, she was a real celebrity. Um, at the end of the day, the world did not just embrace her philosophy and run with it. <laughs> uh, it was still very controversial throughout her life. So I think she was a little disappointed in other people in the world. Uh, but I think she, she embraced the life that she had lived. She had lived, she thought, and I think she did, the life of one of her characters from the novel. She had lived a heroic life, a, a successful life. She had done everything she had set out to do. I, I don't think she had any big regrets in terms of what she had done. Uh, and I think, look, it, it, how, what happens at the end of your life is very much going to be dictated by how you live your life. If you indeed take your life seriously, if you indeed pursue your values, if you're thoughtful and, 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 and you know, make your life the best that it can be and make it interesting and make it enjoyable and make it, and, and you're happy and, and you're thriving and successful and flourishing and you embrace this life, then at the end of life, I, I think you look back and, you know, I'm, I'm not young anymore. You look back and you say, wow, <laughs> cool. I, you know, I lived, I lived a good life. I did a, 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 an amazing number of things. I tried an amazing number of things. I succeeded. I failed, but I, you know, it was I, I you know, it was a well-lived life. That that's what you want at the end, right? You want to say I didn't waste my time. I did. I didn't just sit around. I didn't just drift. I didn't just follow the crowd. I I, I didn't just follow orders. I lived. I used my mind to shape my life. Could have done better here. Could have done better there. Too, you know what difference does it make it's too late now probably surely and you can always learn and uh, if I had the knowledge today that I do when I was 20 yes I, I'm, there are obviously things you would change but that's not the point the point is um, did I do the best that I could do when I did it and and did I did I did I did I achieve flourishing and did I make the effort to make my life great and if the answer is yes, then hey, that's all you can hope, that's all you can do in life in the end. And um, death is kind of sad, but we know it has to happen. So so be it. So the next question is around sort of her early days in 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 the U.S. when she'd come over. Um, she obviously left um, Soviet Russia and she moved into um, theoretically kind of free America. Um, yeah. I think, from what I can tell, she was quite shocked by how easily swayed individuals were within America towards kind of socialist ideas, and that then affected her writing, affected obviously the books that she produced, that, that there was a sort of um, domino effect from that. But I thought it would obviously be get, you, you, you are the expert, so it'd be good to get your take on kind of how obviously she fled that, she came to freedom, theoretically, what she believed to be freedom, and then she experienced something. Did that experience then push her into exploring objectivism for herself further but also then trying to help us as now her readers also understand the broader landscape yeah so i i, I definitely think she came to the united states and was disappointed at the level at which americans understood the freedom that they have the, the willingness you know she came here just before fdr was elected and then she saw what fdr did and and to really move america away from capitalism and away from freedom so she was disappointed in the willingness of America to embrace socialism. In the 1930s, when We the Living came out, she found so many American intellectuals thought communism was fantastic and rejected her book because how can you be critical of communism? It's amazing. Um, and, and, and so that definitely very, very much disappointed her. 
And I think ultimately she was motivating and educating Americans in what they had and, and the value of what they had and, and, uh, and encouraged them not to give it up. And, and, uh, and, but I think a primary motivation, as I said, to develop a philosophy was to write her art, to write her novels. And, and to elevate the individual and to give the individual something to look up at and something to, 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 to um, uh, you know, to, to, to really help people, uh, inspire people to live their lives, the, be the, the best lives that they can live. But then it became clear that she had to articulate that philosophy more explicitly and it wasn't just enough in the novels. And I think she did set out to, in a sense, save America and save liberty and save freedom and... and philosophically complete the work that was started by philosophers in the Enlightenment and, and really ground reason philosophically and ground egoism philosophically and, and, and then ground capitalism as a consequence philosophically and ground freedom. So that was definitely part of what she was trying to do and, and what she was hoping to do uh, and, and what she devoted much of her life, I think, um, particularly after the novels, but even while she was writing the novels, too, is to achieving... That, that philosophical completeness, that philosophical grounding of, uh, of these ideas. Yeah, and then you see those ideas flourish in her novels, um, which is beautiful. Um, okay, this is a question I've been very excited to get to. Um, so, systems of faith, say for example the Catholic Church, um, seem to be antithetical to objectivism. Um, it'd be interesting to kind of hear from you why this is, um, and kind of suggests, because it does suggest that, that these big kind of views of faith are essentially wrong so kind of how, how how are they antithetical and why does that then suggest that a faith system isn't isn't correct yeah so they're really antithetical in every dimension <laughs> <laughs> i mean and start with the idea of a system of faith uh, what is faith faith is the acceptance of something where there is no evidence for it it's the acceptance of something in spite of the lack of evidence, the lack of fact, the lack of reality. Faith is the antithesis of reason, is indeed the rejection of reason. It's saying, I don't need facts and reality and, and uh, my senses and reason. I just know. You know, I, I just know. How do you know? I just know. Revelation, God spoke to me, whatever. But in the end of the day, it's all emotion. All that's left is emotion. Once you reject reason, you're left with emotion. So, so uh, how do you know that God said it to you? Well, you hear it and, you know, you emote it. You, you, you don't observe it out there because it isn't there. So, uh, you, you, so, so faith is just uh, the, 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 the manifestation of, an, of, of, of emotionalism. It's, it's, it's the, 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 the absence of reason and objectivism rejects Anything where reason, um, where, where you, um, where you put reason aside, reason is our means of cognition. Reason is our basic means of survival. Reason is the way we know the world, and and anything that undermines reason needs to be put aside. And religion undermines reason. Uh, they can tell you that um, they believe in God, that it's rational to believe in God, but but it's, it's BS. Nobody believes in God because it's rational. They believe in God because they want to believe in God because emotionally they they are they have committed themselves to believe in God. They they want to for, for some emotionalist reason, um, and then they might rationalize it with some you know all the logical proofs of God, which all of them have been uh, have been shown to be false by philosophers. Is it, did it change any religionist mind? Probably you know maybe at the margin, but most people are not convinced by. Because it's not about reason. It's not about logic. It's not about ra rationality. So that's the beginning of it and, and really, in a sense, the end of it. Because once you accept faith, well, how do we know what we know? Well, it's written in a book, right? And for thousands of years, uh, until Galileo, even physics was written in a book. You can challenge that. 
So, uh, you know, in, in one of the books in the Old Testament, it says that basically the sun goes around the earth because God actually stops the sun from moving across the sky. Uh, uh, so uh, Joshua could win a battle. So he gets more daylight so he can win a battle, right? Stops. You know, he completely contradicts the laws of physics. Um, so, yeah, but God did it. God, God can do anything uh, according to faith. Faith is, faith is completely open. You can do anything. Um, but then Galileo says, well, but you know, the sun doesn't go around the, 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 you know, the earth. The earth goes around the sun. And, oh, wait a minute. How do, you, how do you know that? I use my senses. I use my reason to discover that. Well, that's the conflict. Faith says, no, the other way around. Okay, so, so in some cases, we, we, we are going to dismiss faith and we're going to accept science because it's so obviously true. Okay, but what about morality? What's morality in the Old Testament? Well, it's seven commandments. Are they explained? Are they justified? Are we told why we should follow these commandments? No. Why should you follow the commandments? Because God said so. And are there any cases you wouldn't follow the commandments? Sure. If God tells me not to follow them, I won't follow them. I mean, religion is authoritarianism. It's an authoritarianism granted to a being that doesn't exist, which is a very scary type of authoritarianism, because then what, you want, what you're afraid of is his representatives on earth channeling his will. And there's no, but give me a reason. Like, Abraham doesn't stop and say, kill my son. Why? Why would I do that? that? That's like stupid. That's like so immoral and ridiculous. And it actually, God, it violates one of your commandments. Now, the commandments are given after the story of Abraham. But, you know, I think even, even pre the commandments, everybody understood that murder was wrong. He doesn't do that. He doesn't question God. He doesn't ask him. And the reason Abraham is a moral hero to Jews, Christians, and Muslims He's the one that unites them all. Is because he says, yes, God, I'll do whatever you say. And he takes a son and he tries to murder him. Right? It's pure authoritarianism, unquestioning, mindless. You know, follow the commandments. Follow instructions. Do what you're told to do. And then you see that in religion. You see that in the Inquisition. You see that... In, in every religious sect that's ever existed, you do what you're told. Or you're excommunicated. I mean, think about Spinoza. Spinoza was a philosopher. Well, I mean, he started out as an ultra-Orthodox Jew who, started, who was considered the genius of his age. When he was a child, they thought he was going to be the greatest rabbi ever because he was a genius. He knew the, the Bible. He knew all the stuff like that. But then he started asking questions. Questions that were uncomfortable because the rabbi couldn't answer them. Philosophical questions about the nature of God and the nature of this and why the Bible says this and why this. And, and at some point the rabbis have to say, stop asking questions. This is just the way it is. This is the commandments. This is the truth. Just accept it. And Spinoza couldn't. So they excommunicated him. Literally. His whole family, nobody would speak to him. Nobody, they pretended he wasn't there. If he, if he approached it, they walked right by him. Uh, he, so he was kicked out of his community. Uh, that's religion. That's religion when they take it seriously. So religion when they don't take it seriously is a little bit more moderate. And they, you know, they, you know, they, but at the base of it is an epistemology of authoritarianism. At the base of it is a morality of following commands, doing your duty. And what is particularly in Christianity? What is that duty? That duty is to sacrifice to sacrifice for others, to sacrifice for the poor, to sacrifice for the needy, to sacrifice for your country, to sacrifice for God in the end. And, and the symbol that, they, that Christians wear around their necks, and I'm sorry I'm so anti-religion, but this is life. Um, they wear around their neck is a man being tortured on a cross. I can't think of a, of a, of a, of a worse way to die than dying on a cross, right? It's slow and painful excruciating, horrible, evil. That's the symbol of the religion. Why? Did he die because of sins he committed? No. Why did he die? Because of sins we all committed. He's the ultimate sacrificer for others. He sacrificed his life for our sins. Why would anybody do that? 
Right? I understand somebody dying a horrible death for sins they, they committed. But why would they die for my sins? I should die for my sins. Nobody else should die for my sins. So it's, it, it inculcates altruism, it, it, this view of altruism, of self-sacrifice, of suffering, of suffering as virtue. Um, and, uh, it, it, you know, o- over the whole of Western civilization, unfortunately, there is a man on a cross looking down at us. And uh, that's the big challenge of Western civilization is how do we overcome that? How do we overcome the fact that at, at Western civilization's birth, we have this really horrific sight associated with it? Uh, because Western civilization is ultimately the rejection of the cross, the rejection of the crucifixion. Western civilization is about the embrace of reason and individualism uh, from the Renaissance to the Enlightenment. That's what made the West, and that's what we celebrate today, I think, in the West, or should celebrate today in the West. But religion, religion holds us back. That was maybe a longer answer than you uh, wanted. No, 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 it, it, was, it was fantastic. I, um, it was very helpful for me personally as well. So um, very briefly then, and then I'll let you go. Um, this idea of a man on a cross being at the start of Western civilization, as you mentioned just then, I think that also hangs over myself and many of our of my listeners, um, people listening to this podcast at the moment, just how they were raised, how they were brought up, and kind of how they then lived their life out. And then at some point, something changed, and they began to question it all, and the sort of house came down, as, 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 yeah. as you will. How, how would you encourage people to, it's quite a personal question, but how would you encourage people to begin to, I guess, move forwards from that place to begin to try and and understand and ground reason in in the sense we've been talking about it this evening and also begin to live their life out and and explore this space with almost excitement how do you yeah how do you encourage yeah, I mean, them to I, do that i think excitement is the right word i mean mm. i think people i think that the, the important realization is this is it this life is it it's nothing beyond this life there's nothing beyond this world this reality now, that means you better take it seriously. That means you've only got one shot at this. There's not multiple lives. So you're not going to get reincarnated. You're not going to heaven and try all over again. You're not going to be punished in hell for some thing that was written 2,000 years ago. It's just you. And, and that might sound lonely, but I view that as, wow, what an opportunity. You get to shape your life. You get to discover the truth for y- the, the truth. And, and, and it's for you. You're not discovering the truth for some, uh, you know, for some, uh, 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 something beyond you, right? I, I mean, uh, you hear a lot about, you've you got to find meaning that's beyond yourself. What is beyond myself? My meaning is me. My meaning is my life. My meaning is my values, the things that I love. My meaning is my morality, my, my goals in life. And, and it, makes it, it makes life much more accessible. You're not trying to please some being that you don't see and don't understand. You're not, you know, one of the first things you need to really shrug off is original sin. You're not born with sin. You're not bad because you're human. You're not evil because you're alive. You're not evil because you're thinking and producing and creating uh, you know, sex is not something to be ashamed of and ha- hidden and, and, and run away from. Life is to be enjoyed and embraced. And, but it's not easy. Uh, you know, there's a lot of responsibility there. Now it's up to you to figure that out, to figure out what life means. So it's true that, for example, sex is not evil and dirty and hidden as, as, as many religionists would have us believe. But it's also true that sex is not trivial and meaningless and just have it with anybody now you have to discover the true spiritual and 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 true value orientation of sex and then and then embrace it and then you know figure out who to have it with but um but and that's true of every part of life and it's it's not true that uh, you should sacrifice for the needy and you should sacrifice for this and you should sacrifice for you shouldn't sacrifice for anybody figure out what your values are what's important to you and go get it Go, go strive towards it. Don't use other people. Don't exploit other people. Don't lie to other people. Don't, uh, you know, live life as a moral human being. Expect other people to, to be moral. But morality means be rational, be, be uh, you know, honesty. Even honesty for Rand is different, right? Most people think honesty is don't lie. 
But lying is the trivial part of honesty. The real issue about honesty is be committed to reality. Be committed to the facts. Don't lie to yourself. But it's more than that. When you're, ma when you're making a decision, when you're making a judgment, make sure you have all the relevant facts. Make sure you're being objective, right? That's, that's, that's the objectivism. So I think, you know, I think, you know, the, the, there's a real opportunity for rebirth um, spiritually, materially, in every respect by, by shrugging off religion. There's a realization that your life is yours, nobody else's. You get to live it. You get to make choices about it. You get to choose your values. You don't have to accept commandments or the preacher or anybody else's. You get to choose who to associate with. You get to choose who to trade with. Now, yes, it's work. Yes, it's real responsibility. But that's part of the fun, right? Work should be enjoyable. Responsibility, because it's your responsibility, the rewards are also yours. And life is to be enjoyed. Life is to be enjoyed. You should, you should experience joy. You just, you, it's not a grind. And, uh, you know, I think original sin is really tough for people to get over. I, th I think, you know, you shouldn't feel guilty. There's nothing to feel guilty about unless you've done something bad. If you've done something bad, feel guilty. But if you haven't done anything bad, get rid of that guilt. I know Catholics have a hard time with that. Jews have a hard time with that. But you should never feel guilty for something you didn't do. Yeah, thank you for that. That was powerful. Um, yeah, and before I let you go, where would you want to direct people to to find you, to engage with your work, and potentially reach out? Yeah, I mean, I, I do a, a, a podcast, a YouTube thing, uh, you know, every day, pretty much, six days a week. So uh, YouTube, if they, people look me up on YouTube, I have a channel there. I'm on all the podcasting apps as well, so if they, if they just want to listen, it's on there. Um, I have a website, but the website just ultimately refers everybody to YouTube. Uh, they can also find I've got some books. They can uh, search my name on Amazon, and they'll come across some of my books. And, of course, I, I encourage everybody to look up Ayn Rand, and that's, that's more important. And, uh, you know, the best resources on Ayn Rand is, is, uh, is Ayn Rand.org, A-Y-N-R-A-N-D.org, uh, which is the Ayn Rand Institute's website. Uh, and, of course, go read The Fountainhead. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there'll be links to all that in the description. Yeah, well, thank you so much for coming on the show and talking with me today. It's been a pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you.